and lots and lots wow. and lots of orchids in jars. Um, what this means is that we can propagate orchids from seed, usually our seed, although sometimes people do donate and will grow orchids from that too. Um, and this allows us to produce, you know, thousands and thousands of orchids, not all of which make it through. Right, I'm going to walk over to the lab now. And just on the way, I'd like to show you. So you'll hear more about our latest Borneo trip later. But these are some of the pictures from the Rwanda trip, which was done, I can't remember, which was done about two years before the orchid trip. So, see which photo is that. So, we got photos of. If I could add just a just a little bit, uh, so so we're we're still working with uh, Rwanda and a school and a college there, and so we've had students spend six months out there as well as uh, four school trips, uh, and uh, if you're coming along to the World Orchid Congress, you'll see a bit more about our work in Rwanda that's happening there. Simon, I don't want to interrupt, but are, are you familiar with the, the lodge in Rwanda that um, Michael Tibbs has planted thousands of orchids at? It's in their Volcanoes National Park, where the uh, gorillas are. Yeah, uh, so, so I know Mike well. Um, we will, we've been working in uh, a different part of Rwanda. So we've been in Nyungwe Rainforest, and particularly working with a college which is the Katabi College of Conservation and Environmental Management. And that's a college where they train the, the guides of the national parks of Rwanda and also a lot of the other African countries from around the area. So it's a real center of excellence uh, and they are the most amazing people um, who will eventually become the leaders of the national parks in those countries. So doing orchid conservation and propagation from seed is a really useful thing in terms of informing their future decisions about conservation opportunities and practicalities so that uh, those young people uh, from the region have a, a really good understanding of, of what can be done. Awesome. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please I'm, I'm, so I've, I've moved on now. I've moved on now to the lab. Here we have six airflow cabinets. These are where we um, do the actual work with our orchids because media is very, very, very good for growing everything, including lots of mold and bacteria. It's really important to keep a sterile environment. So this is our storage airflow cabinet. So that's got the tweezers wrapped in cling film. That means we have to sterilize everything. At the top of here, you have a fan and a filter. It pushes air through. This air inside here is clean. We have a constant flow of clean air, therefore no airborne microbes can get inside the flow cabinet. We have still more orchids stored in here. We are really running out of room, if we're honest. Um, they're, all, they're all organized by date that they've last been replaced. That's because it allows us to keep a steady flow and try and keep them all in check. Um, I'm quickly now going to pass over to my other screen and I'm going to quickly unmute so that unmute on that one so you can see it, but I'm going to keep this one as an audio device. So, so this is my other device. This is the one that's This is the one that's going to be used in order to do uh, the replacing demo. So if you can pin that, if you know how, if not, just try and keep an eye on it. Okay. And now I'm back to this one, which allows me not to get horrible feedback through my headphones. So keep an eye on that one. So this is a replacing technique. Because we start with orchids, which are very seed, which is incredibly small, it's the smallest seed in the plant kingdom. Having this 
uh, this means that we end up with a lot of plants in one jar, and those plants can't all grow to a maturity where they're able to be taken out of the jars in that jar. They don't have enough space. So what we need to do is we need to have several replating stages. Just move that out of the camera. Someone, yeah. sure. um, we need to have several replating stages where we start again. We split them up. So this is by Plumeria verosodii. It probably only needs one or maybe two replates until it's ready to come out of the gel lock. But as you can see, it's getting quite crowded in there. We're going to go down to the greenhouse, Talis. So we'll pass yep. over to us. We'll have to yep. read one. So I'm just going to do a quick demo on how we go about replacing. This here, yep, this here. This is a hot bead sterilizer. It's similar to what's used in order to sterilize scissors and things. And this is where we keep our tweezers. That just kills any microbes that are on the tweezers. So I'm going to start by removing lids. I'm just popping them on top of other gels there. Alice, if good. I could just um, interject quickly, if you could maybe move your, um, your device over a little bit because you're flip down the middle of the um, left hand side of our screen. And also when you're talking behind the hood, your audio goes out. So um, you just need to make a slight adjustment. There you go. You don't want to miss a second. Can you hear me better now? Much better, yes. Can you still hear me if I do this? Can you still hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Right. So I'm starting off just by sterilizing my hands with some hand sanitizer. It's going to kill most of the bacteria on my hand. Kill and COVID. Bit. Okay, what it can get. So I'm just going to pop the lids off here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these tweezers. The ends of these trees are now very hot. These are glass beads, so you get heated to very high temperatures in order to kill everything. So I'm just dipping them in the empty jar quickly just to cool off the ends. That ensures we don't get fried orchid. Fried orchid doesn't grow very well. Delicious so, though. Especially with it. butter. Never tried it myself. Now I'm just grabbing some clumps of these plants. Popping in the other jar. I'm trying to make sure they are a little bit spread out, but I don't really need to care about which way up they go at this stage because they're pretty good at sorting themselves out. I'm just grabbing uh, a lid to pop on that one. I grab another empty jar and we repeat. I am making sure I put my tweezers back in the hot bead sterilizer between every jar. Because again, we're just trying to get that little bit extra sterileness. Just ensure that everything stays clean. I'll leave that to finish up later. Because I want to show you quickly what happens when we don't keep everything clean. So if I bring you over here with this one, do we have any really disgusting ones? So, if you can see in that jar, you have an orchid, you also have a horrible white smear. That white smear is bacterial growth. It's where we've just had, you know, maybe a tweezer that wasn't fully sterilized. Maybe we just got unlucky. But the issue with bacterial growth is it generally grows faster than the orchid. Now, the reason this orchid hasn't just been washed out and binned is because it's quite big. There's a reasonable chance that the orchid is going to be ready to come out of the jar before the bacteria kills it. So we have this. This is our kind of last chance windowsill. These are the ones which are going to be going for it, but we can't replate it because once we replate it, we break that sterileness. Uh, some of the ways that we keep our jars sterile, just before I hand over, um, we either pressure cook them or we use this thing. This is an autoclave. This is our autoclave. It's basically an automatic pressure cooker. Just means we can heat things to very high temperatures at very high pressures without having to stand by it all the time. And that means we can kill all the microbes 
that stand the chance of threatening our orchids. I think I'm done up here. So, Simon, is it okay if I pass over to you now? No, that would be great. Thank you, Talis. So, um, I think you may have noticed Talis is, is quite a scientist and she is waiting at the moment to hear from Cambridge University if, um, if she has an offer there for next year. So, uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of Talis uh, from uh, the, the way she changes the world in so many ways, I think, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. So, and then, and then to remember, um, we wouldn't be... <laughs> Thank, you. Wouldn't <laughs> Thank you, Talis. Uh, so I'll, maybe I'll give you a very... Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Is he frozen? Um, I think so. Um, Simon, can you hear us? Because we've lost you, I think. Yeah, yeah, there's just a black square in there. Square now. So tell us we have lost Simon. Don't worry, I'm on my way over right now. <laughs> <laughs> tell us, save the day. Beautiful blackness. On mute. I think we I think we're back. Are we back? Yes. You are back. Great. Yeah, that's great. There, there, that's a Zoom moment. You can, uh, you have to appreciate those. It reminds you just how, um, how far apart we are. Um, so I was just saying, I, I don't know quite when you cut out. We're a, we're a state uh, secondary school, and so the school when I arrived, which was 32 years ago, had some old greenhouses because we were the secondary modern school. So that was the students who who didn't pass their 11 plus, and so horticulture was part of their curriculum. And uh, I took that over and thought maybe we can do something interesting with orchids. It may well be that some of you um, uh, remember Keith Andrew, who I know spent... Oops, he froze again. <laughs> this is very interesting. Uh, Tom, he's frozen yeah. again. I'm writing to him right now. <laughs> oh, Talis. Hello. He's about to use mine. All right. Yeah. There you go. It should work. <laughs> I think it's pretty remarkable that we can do this at all. Um, a couple of glitches, not a big mm -hmm. deal. You know, we all realize that the reason why, you know, this is 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. over there is because this is literally on the other side of our planet. So we're still not hearing Simon, right? Something has happened to the sound, even though he's on palaces. Something has happened, yes. And um, it's not just the sound, it's uh, the, the image froze. Um, I'm hoping that palaces device might be, might have a stronger signal. Um, well, I'm seeing his image on Talus's device, but no sound. Let me see if I can unmute it from here. No, it's, it's not muted. It's not? No. It, it's, so tell us, can you, can you hear us? Both of her devices are muted. Yeah, yeah. I think I think we're in. I've I've switched to four G. Just it appears we've got a few uh, internet connection issues. So uh, we'll we'll go on four G and hopefully that will keep us going. 
4G. Okay. We can hear you now. 5G is faster, but 4G is stronger, so go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think I'm going to pass you over to have a look at some of the plants in our greenhouse. We, we grow our sections by different uh, climate zones. So we have the advantage of having a very cold temperature outside, which means we can grow cool orchids, warm orchids, whatever we like, just by controlling in the greenhouse. So we have five sections in our greenhouse. So if I start at the far end, uh, I'm walking through a few sections here. We start at this end with Cool Asia. So Cool Asia is the, is the orchids of the mountains of the Himalayas. So we've spent a lot of time in Sikkim in the Himalayas, which is, I think if I was gonna recommend one place on the planet uh, that you should not miss, it would be the Sikkim Himalaya, uh, an extraordinary place. It's one of the places you can see a lot of uh, great orchids on trees by just taking a taxi and, and, and following the main road. So uh, mm. a, a phenomenal place. And the sort of orchids we're talking about is uh, Dendrobiums and Cilogenes. I think I've got Dendrobium infundibulum uh, flowering at the moment here. There we are. I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll give you a bit of Dendrobium infundibulum. Uh, we are massive fans of Cymbidiums and Cilogenes. Uh, probably a bit of a challenge, is it, to grow those in Hawaii? Uh, it depends on uh, how high up the mountain you are. All oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think I think I'd find myself at the top actually. So uh, the advantage of being cool <laughs> is you can do what you like. Um, uh, Izzy, do you want to come and explain about uh, the, the orchids we've got here? And you can talk onto my uh, my laptop. Um, I've just walked through into Warm Asia. So our Warm Asia section we keep at a minimum of seventeen. And this is where we grow the plants that relate to our projects in Laos and in Sarawak. Uh, and it's also where we keep most of our African orchids. Uh, Izzy, where, where do you want to start? Do you want to start there? Yeah, if you stay on my laptop, because I'm taking it through my phone, that's, that, I think that'll work. Is that all right, or are you, are you live again? Yeah, c come and do it through mine. I think that's going to be the easiest thing. Uh, so this is our um, warm America section. So this is where we grow the plants of um, uh, South and Central America below about a thousand meters. And yeah, I think Laura's going to start us off. Do you want to? Do you want to start off, Laura? Yeah. Uh, so this is a Cattleya persevillana. Is that right? That's right. I yeah. Can never pronounce them. <laughs> um, it can be seen. We uh, can't hear her though. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to? Shout a bit, shout a bit louder, Laura. Okay. Uh, it can be seen in Venezuela and Colombia. It's pollinated by bees, uh, so the yellow stripes inside. I don't know if you can like see them. Uh, to like direct the bee to the right part of the flower. So because they're pollinated by bees as well, they smell quite sweet. And uh, you were on our trip to uh, Sarawak, Laura. What was the thing that really got you about the trip and the forest you found there? Um, I don't know, it was just really cool seeing it all like natural rather than in like the pots and things that we have in the greenhouse. So. Great, thanks Laura. I'm gonna take you next door to uh, Izzy. So Izzy is in our Warm Asia uh, section. Uh, hi. Do you wanna take, you take your mask off yeah. so you can be heard? Hi. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about this cat here. Uh, uh, I'm really, I'm Anglicum sesquicum <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Yeah. Um, Izzy's another of our not really a morning person people, but yeah. she's doing really well. Um, so this cat, can you see it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's moth pollinated. This flower here has opened because when they first open, they open green, and then as they open wider, they become white. And Simon, um, sh she's almost inaudible. If you could get okay. a little. Should I shout again? Yeah. 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 Um, so <laughs> this is uh, a catlia, and it's moth pollinated. And you can see that this has just opened because um, it's green, whereas this um, you can tell it's open later because it's turned red. And um, it has this big launch pad here because when the moth comes to pollinate it, because it has such a long tongue, it needs to be able to get it into this tiny tube. So have a see your horse. So yeah, it needs a really long tongue basically. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. yeah to, um, what was what was the thing that you were most excited about about the trip to Sarawak? What uh, really affected? culture? Really, I really like the culture over there. I think it's really interesting, and it's good to um, see something different than here. 
and learn new things from their perspective. That's cool. Thank you, Izzy. Um, I'm going to take you through. I'm going to show you a few of uh, a few of my favourite uh, favourite orchids. So if I take you through, we've also got what we call our Cool Americas section. So our Cool Americas section is where we grow plants from the mountains of South and Central America. So we're talking of anything above about 1,200 meters. So uh, there's quite a few that we've um, we've come across in the wild that's quite spectacular. So uh, down here we've got uh, Sophronitis coccinea on this side and Sophronitis wittigiana on this side. Uh, these taste called Cattleya coccinea and Cattleya wittigiana. Um, one of the great treats we had in our expeditions to Brazil was to be able to be in the forest where these plants were abundant uh, and we were working with the Rio Atlantic Forest Trust and my students were able to set up and film hummingbirds coming to pollinate uh, the Cattleya wittigiana and it was fascinating to see the fact that we had six species that came to visit but only one of those came out with pollen attached and so there was certainly some some evidence that these are species specific although being used by a number of uh, of different species and it's uh, it's one of the fantastic things of taking young people to uh, rainforests is of course you are surrounded by experiments that nobody's done yet uh, and I would highly commend you to to get experimenting because it's uh, it's a real treat to see all the things that are out there. Uh, at the moment, because we're in the winter, uh, the roof of our greenhouse is very pink. Uh, so up there, these are our uh, Lelia Gouldiana and our Lelia anceps. Um, we, uh, we're, we're a real fan uh, of orchids that are straightforward to grow um, because there's something we can share with other people once you, you get to those. Um, but when it comes to our collection, uh, the I, I suppose the primary thing we're interested in is diversity and the stories that all of those those plants can tell. Um, we've got, uh, hang on, we've got one more section down at the end here, which is our, our temperate section. This one we keep at a, uh, a minimum of seven degrees. So it's not doing a, a lot of flowering at the moment, uh, but this is another one that's got a lot of the cool species such as uh, Cymbidiums and uh, Cylogenes, uh, a, a lot of which link with our our projects in Sikkim. What I'd like to do, I'm going to take you through and we're going to show some of the uh, things that happened on our expedition to Sarawak. Uh, and can I say a massive thank you for your support for the next bit of work we're doing over there. Uh, it's, it's very exciting as you'll see because of the, the passion of the, the local people. We're being able to help just a little bit in terms of uh, learning about orchids. Uh, and so I will try and do a screen share and then I'm going to ask some of the students to help me with the uh, with the presentation here. So give me just a minute and I will screen share. Uh, let's have a look which one could I, I'm going to have to go for my desktop to start with. And uh, let's see, this is the one and I am sharing. And if I present with a bit of luck, you can all see that. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can uh, see a picture of some rainforest in Sarawak? That's fantastic. Um, uh, so I'll ask people to come over in a little while to have a little look. This is a, this is a picture of uh, my students. Uh, I think, can you see yourself in that, Izzy and Laura? Um, I'm in it. It's me and Hannah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hannah, so there we, we've got Izzy Harris near the start. Yeah. And I'm not sure who that is. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, we're, we're there with the students of the MRSM school uh, in Kuching. And uh, this is us out in one of the national parks. So uh, I'm going to take you through some of the information for anyone who's not sure where Sarawak is. Uh, Sarawak is a Malaysian state uh, in Borneo. Uh, and we were contacted about two years ago uh, by a group called the Sarawak Orchid Society, who were very keen to do something about the protection and uh, uh, education around their native orchid species. And it, it's been an absolute delight to work with them. Uh, we'd been over twice. And the picture at the top here is uh, part of the team on our last trip in the in the city of Kuching. Um, and this is a picture of us uh, at the school. So uh, that's uh, the group of students who went on our second trip with the uh, students uh, from the school at MRSM. Uh, it's uh, a terrific school. It's a school that's been set up uh, charitably uh, to support uh, students who are disadvantaged 
that have uh, potential in science. So it fits very well with uh, the aims that we're after. And um, it's a very mixed school in terms of uh, representing uh, pupils from uh, all the different uh, tribes and ethnic groups of Sarawak. Uh, so you've got uh, tribal people, particularly uh, from uh, the uh, Penan tribe and the, the other, uh, I'll, I'll come back to the tribes in a bit. We, we, we learned some great, great cultural stuff. Uh, we've got uh, uh, ethnic um, Malaysians and ethnic Chinese, uh, and it's really great to see how the, the, the mix happens there. Um, we're, we're also very keen to work with um, helping them get publicity for what they're doing. There is no question that education uh, is great if it happens in schools, but it's so much better if it happens outside schools too. Uh, and this was one of the newspaper articles we we're also on, on Borneo TV. And in terms of the activities that happened when we got there, um, a lot of the time I could sit back and do nothing at all. So this is uh, the student team that I took. And so what happens is each of my students takes a workshop to share with the students we're working with. And that way uh, we can share all the different skills about the lab, about uh, orchid botany, about conservation, and, uh, and also orchid life cycle. Though, so that when we then go out into the forest, we can look at what's happening with the orchids there as well as uh, the lab we've set up. The lab you can see here is uh, is Sarawak's first and uh, they're, they're being incredibly uh, productive with it already so that's uh, we took over the lab in our suitcases apart from the flow cabinet which we sent uh, air freight and uh, we, we've got a plan where we think we can set up a lab for about um, 3,000 pounds which uh, means that it's very accessible in terms of lots of educational establishments with a bit of support from uh, uh, organizations we had support here from the chief minister of Sarawak uh, as well as uh, support from the British Council which helped with some of the funding early on and there's some more of the workshops uh, do you want to say anything about the workshops yeah, yeah. so Talis do you want to start off in terms of how the workshops went um, so we had a rotor we had some people doing day one we had some people doing day two and some people were doing it over two days um, I'm just going to give some examples of the ones you can see here. So at the back, uh, just underneath the clock, you have me and Ed and some of the girls doing a making media workshop. So if you remember in the lab, the black stuff, making that black stuff. Um, we have Laura doing what I think was our lab safety workshop. We have um, to the right over the to the right side of the main photo, we have people doing the orchid gami, which was the different parts of an orchid. So they started off by dissecting an orchid flower and labeling the different parts. And then we had Amalia who invented a workshop where she'd made the parts of an orchid out of paper and they kind of origami stuck it back together again. And then over on the left, we have TZ testing, which was one of our two day workshops which was which is seed viability testing without actually having to germinate the seeds. That's yes, thank you, nice. Talis. Uh, so come on, Laura, Laura, tell us something about the uh, lab safety workshop. That sounds that sounds amazing. How did how did they respond to that? Uh, so Keep they found it yeah. quite interesting because they've not really done lab safety at their school before. because They haven't got enough like facilities to make enough labs. So what we did was we went through the basics and then we got them to create big posters and do diagrams of things on how to say, stay safe whilst they're using certain chemicals and things to hang up. So That's brilliant, that Laura. Um, one of the things I couldn't help noticing is they were quite gory, their pictures of what happened if you didn't follow the yeah, lab yeah. safety <laughs> rules, which I, th I think went, went down an absolute storm. Um, uh, one of the terrific things we had at the end of the workshops is the students that we'd worked with uh, ran uh, a, an expo session for all the rest of the school. So this gave a chance for the, all the students that we'd worked with to share the skills so that we've ended up with a, a whole school who are now uh, orchid propagation experts uh, and have um, a real determination to work for this uh, in the future. Uh, we also got a chance to visit lots of national parks. Uh, Isi, do you want to mention some of the national parks? Uh, uh, so one of the national parks we went to was in Mulu and it was really great because we 
uh, we got to um, do this treetop walk and up in the tops of the treetops is where a lot of the orchids are found. So we saw a lot of different species and it was really great to get that big over the top of the view of the rainforest. Um, another one was Mount Pueh, which was one of the more interesting ones on the fact that it was quite scary. <laughs> Um, we had to cross a river that was uh, not exactly the best idea, but it was quite fun and entertaining. And um, even though it was really scary, it was definitely more of the fun ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is uh, Baku National Park. Um, I really enjoyed this one because we saw a lot of monkeys, which was really great to see. It's, up to, uh, it's great to see them in the wild. And there was definitely a lot of wildlife up there, um, insect wise, and uh, a lot of different plants, because it's not just orchids we see. We saw this really strange looking fungi as well. Uh, thank, thanks, Izzy. So just running through some of the things, we, we also obviously got a chance to see lots of primates. Um, one of the great things about going anywhere looking for orchids, of course, is you bump into so much other stuff. Uh, so um, uh, obviously Borneo is very famous for orangutans. Uh, we also came across uh, this wonderful proboscis monkey uh, up on a cliff uh, in uh, Baku, as well as the uh, silverleaf monkey, which is the one doing the leap. That was a, a leap over the top of one of my students with its little orange baby attached and the long-tailed macaque. And uh, a whole range of other mammals. Um, so, uh, we also spent more time in the forest at night than maybe a lot of people do, simply because we're very slow at moving. So uh, the uh, people we were working with in, in Mulu were a little surprised just how much interest we had in, in every, every little tree we bumped into. So coming back at night, you then come across some other animals. So the one at the top right uh, is called a moon rat. Uh, and uh, it's kind of the size of a small dog. Uh, and it was one of those experiences where uh, when it appeared under in the torchlight, uh, the students screamed and ran one way and the uh, moon rat screamed and ran the other way. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a, a nice chance to find things. We, the, the wildlife uh, in Mulu Forest is, is quite extraordinary. The pygmy squirrels are very cute. Uh, the bearded pigs are on the beach uh, looking for land crabs. And the one down at the left hand at the bottom is, is about three million bats. Uh, which come from deer cave. So it's got some extraordinary places you've probably seen on, on, on wildlife uh, films. Uh, this is deer cave. The little tiny things you can see at the bottom of people, giving you the idea you could fit a cathedral inside this place and it is home to, to three million bats that come out and fly and feed across the, uh, the forest later the next day. Um, we're also kind of into insects. Uh, and so these are lantern bugs uh, and uh, a leaf bug and a, a trilobite beetle, which uh, we were all delighted to find. Uh, it has its fair share of uh, venomous snakes, uh, particularly the uh, Borne and pit viper, which we bumped into several times. I think I've got one later that's on an orchid. And uh, uh, the good thing about these is they don't seem to be very aggressive, unlike some of the poisonous snakes we've met in Central America. Uh, and so they kind of hits, hang about on their, on their trees. Uh, for long periods uh, and are quite happy to be photographed, which is uh, always quite exciting. Let me move on to the next one. Uh, yep, yeah, lots of lizards as well. Uh, so these, uh, that's a Bornean forest dragon in the middle. Uh, the male we saw as well, which has much longer spines on its back. And that's a green crested lizard. So if anyone, if anyone wants to experience uh, multitudinous wildlife, um, particularly Mulu rainforest uh, is, is the most diverse place we found in terms of the, the animals present. Uh, lots of uh, frogs and uh, other amphibians. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're aware the dominant sound in a rainforest is actually frogs. Uh, and uh, certainly in there, it is the rough-sided frog. Uh, they all seem to be speaking English, which surprised us. So the rough-sided frog uh, says help uh, repeatedly. Uh, and uh, we have another frog that says what, uh, another frog that says how, and another frog that says why. So we spent most of the night answering questions asked to us by, by frogs. And let me do you some orchids. Uh, th this, is, this is an orchid talk. Uh, so um, 
Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Dimorphorchus lowii. Uh, we were very pleased to see a lot of these in the wild. This is the one that produces different flowers on the top of the stem uh, to the lower part of the stem. And as I was saying about experiments that haven't been done yet, uh, I don't think there's a really good explanation yet as to why this plant has evolved uh, this habit. Uh, so uh, it would be very nice to be able to spend uh, a few weeks parked next to one of these, but not necessarily what the one on the left. That one's got uh, a very large Bornean pit viper lying across the top of it. Uh, and uh, that uh, snake stayed across that orchid for about two days. So that was one we didn't get very close to. Um, uh, we were also uh, very fortunate to find um, Paph sanderi uh, flowering uh, on the cliffs of Mulu. So uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the story of, of uh, Paph uh, sanderi. It uh, was discovered in the 1880s uh, and uh, caused an absolute storm because of its petals that are over a metre long, as you can see, dangling from the cliff there. Um, it was then lost to cultivation and uh, people were beginning to wonder whether it had actually ever existed in the first place. And I remember in the late 1970s when it was rediscovered, uh, the excitement it caused. Uh, I have to say hats off to the Sarawak uh, Forest Department and the work of the National Parks. The fact that as a, a visitor, you can see an orchid uh, this rare, this valuable, um, so close to where people are able to travel. Uh, gives you real hope, I think, in terms of the protection of the forest. They've, they've obviously got a lot of things right, the fact that these plants uh, are still there. Hang on. Extraordinary. Uh, okay, still working. So we've also got some um, Grammatophyllum uh, speciosum. So uh, these are big trees we're finding in a lot of the rainforests here. Uh, and uh, big orchids. Hang on, let me press. I'm trying to find it. There we are. There's a, 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 proper, a properly big one in the, uh, in the forest there. Lots of tiddly miniatures as well. This is uh, Chlysostoma. We grow lots of Chlysostomas in our, in our warm uh, Asia section as we're rather keen on miniatures. I've actually got, if I get my camera right, here we are. I have Chlysostoma subulatum flowering at the moment, which is in front of your camera where you can see me. And uh, this is it growing in the wild in, uh, in Sarawak. Uh, we also bumped into Varides odorata. Uh, this was uh, at the bottom of Mount Pue and was one of, one of those classics where you, you, you park the bus, you travel up a mountain looking for orchids, you get back to the bus and you find the best orchid in flowers actually right next to where the bus was parked, but you hadn't noticed it on the way up, which I, I'm sure is something you've all experienced when you've been out in the forest. Um, I'd like to just um, uh, show you um, uh, uh, Tengu here, who's a scientist and one of the real uh, passions behind the local group uh, and a real inspiration. She's doing work, particularly at the moment, a PhD looking at the reintroduction of biodiversity uh, in uh, palm oil, because uh, as I, I'm sure you're very aware, a lot, of, a lot of Sarawak and a lot of Borneo is now covered in palm oil instead of forest. Uh, and so it's part of the research project looking at how the way that palm oil is managed can be improved so that a greater amount of biodiversity can cope in there. Uh, and she's particularly working at the moment with dendrobium uh, and osmum. Uh, lots of dendrobiums. Uh, this is uh, acerosum, which we saw along the rivers. Uh, epigeniums. Uh, so we've seen these in the Himalayas, uh, different members of the genus. Uh, and uh, this is probably the most horticulturally attractive one that I've come across, uh, and again was this was um, this was hanging around where the orangutans were. So it, it's one of those things. If there's a reserve for one thing, then you can guarantee that uh, uh, other other species and animals and plants are going to uh, going to flourish too. Uh, it is home to a lot of Phalaenopsis. So uh, Phalaenopsis bellina uh, on the right here is the uh, state flower of Sarawak. Uh, and uh, again, a, a treat to see lots of the plants that we're used to growing in the, in the lowland forests there. Uh, Bulbophyllums, uh, we have about uh, 48 different Bulbophyllum species, uh, fantastically diverse genus, uh, and uh, very much the same when you go to Sarawak that the Bulbophyllums will keep surprising you with the, uh, the form and the way that they uh, produce their flowers. Uh, a good example here is Bulbophyllum grudensi 
grew in the deepest dark shade we've uh, ever found a, uh, an epiphytic orchid flowering in. Uh, so this was right at the bottom of the trees in deep, deep shade, whereas uh, Bulbophyllum coriaceum was in very bright light in a very thin scrubby forest uh, on the top of a rocky plateau uh, at Baku. Uh, Sologenes too, I've men men mentioned Sologenes a few times, so uh, very abundant in the lowland forests and the trees uh, often uh, have very large plants like the one you can see on the right hand side here, uh, as well as the smaller ones like uh, Sologeny motlii. Uh, lots of terrestrials too, uh, so um, uh, I was quite chuffed personally to see uh, a, a Noedia because I, I've not come across that, though I've seen it in lots of botanical books because of its primitive uh, nature. Um, uh, Thanias, I've got some others here, Calanthes and uh, Brumhedia, which uh, was growing uh, amongst uh, very open scrub on the top of the rock plateau at Baco. Um, the other one, of course, is the great thing about visiting anywhere is you come across orchids you've never seen before. Uh, what a fantastically wonderful, diverse world we live in, don't we? Uh, and this is uh, Acreopsis was a, a new genus uh, for me. Uh, um, yeah, I think I've done enough on uh, there. We are. Let's, let's move on from orchids. Uh, Izzy mentioned earlier the, uh, the mushrooms that we saw. We saw some fantastic uh, fungi. This is the veiled stinkhorn fungus. Uh, which is a pretty cool or uh, cool fungus. It's a pretty cool name, and the uh, Latin name caused some hilarity as well, being uh, Phallus multicolor, which uh, has, uh, has some appeal as well. Uh, we've also got a, a wonderful uh, scorpion at the top there, uh, and uh, Ed, that was your tip, wasn't it, to, to take a, a UV torch with us yes. so that we could see things? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let, let me let me just I'll just pass you over to Ed. Do you want to say anything about spotting the uh, uh, the scorpion? Um, I wasn't there at the time, actually. You weren't there at the time. It was the other Ed, probably screamed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, of course, another bit of screaming, which, uh, which is always part of the fun. The one that glowed in the dark, yeah. yeah it was, uh, it was spectacular. I don't know, almost got a hand, but like... Yeah. yeah. We've, um, uh, we also did some, um, uh, a lot of work with our partners. So one of the things we go out of our way to do is to make as link many links as possible. And so we linked up with the uh, forest department and spent some time in their herbarium. Anyone like to comment on the herbarium? Tell us. It was very cool and I think they were really confused as to why there were loads of school-aged children being really interested in very old preserved orchids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're used to a large group of teenagers uh, squealing with dis delight at the uh, at, at finding right. a, a dried specimen of, of one of their favorite species, which was, was terrific. Um, Definitely in uh, herbarium in general. Yeah, yeah, but they, it was it was a lovely experience, uh, and again, one we're going to do a lot more work with in the in the future. We've also um, spent some time talking to the Minister of Agriculture, uh, and also there's uh, an educational organisation that looks at developing technical skills for the people of the area who are very keen on using the lab in a in, in a wider context because lots of the skills are very transferable. Um, uh, I'm going to finish off just by talking about the Penan tribe. So uh, we are living in an age where a lot of indigenous forest people are, are having a really rough time. And one group that has been suffering is the Penan tribe, who are uh, a, a tribe of forest nomads. Uh, and of course, when it comes to deforestation, uh, the people who suffer most are the people who have had those as their traditional lands, although they have no land rights, uh, who then get displaced and whose way of life uh, is, is very much taken away and destroyed. Um, and uh, we've developed um, some very good friends in the Penan tribe and on the uh, extreme right end here is, is Henry, who is uh, the guide we work with in Mulu. And Henry has got a great story really in that he grew up uh, in the forest as a child who never went to school. Uh, when the national park was set up, he was able to then get a job uh, first uh, as helping the rangers uh, and then he became a ranger himself. And then he taught himself uh, English and uh, other languages, became a guide and is now an international bat expert. Uh, and I think it's terrific if the educational opportunities are offered to people who've been disadvantaged by the way our world has changed. 
uh, then they have something really special to offer. Um, this is us at the Penan uh, village that's been set up for the tribe in the Mulu area. And uh, one of the things we were able to do was to provide some scientific equipment for the school. The other thing was to learn things back. So I don't know if you can see the picture at the top, uh, that's Talis uh, with her nose flute and that's Henry's mum who makes nose flutes. So I'm gonna stop sharing because I, uh, I want to show you a little bit about, uh, about nose flutes. Let's stop share, here we are. So um, Ed, would you like to say a little bit about making nose flutes? Um, uh, yeah, so basically they're a bit of bamboo where you cut off at the top part. So you can see here's an un unfinished one. So we cut it off and we just po poke a hole through. And funnily enough, that gives an opening that creates a sound. Okay, that's terrific. Um, we, uh, it's one of the great things that if you're a nomad, you can't carry a lot of stuff with you. So being able to make your musical instruments from things that are around the forest uh, is a terrific way to live. And so nose flutes really appeal to us. Uh, when uh, Talis first picked up a nose flute and had a little go, she is our, our musician, um, she became so expert in the first five minutes that the locals were clapping. So, um, so uh, Talis is gonna give you a, a brief, a brief uh, nose fluting for you to enjoy. There we are, a round of applause for Talis, I think. And, uh, and, and Ed, who was showing you the mechanics uh, because he's much more of an engineer than a musician, uh, was then very keen that here was a way we could raise money to help the Penan tribe. So he's been selling nose flutes uh, and we became quite famous actually. We've, we've been on telly in the UK. We are the only school with a nose flute orchestra and uh, we, we sell nose flutes um, so that we can raise money for the tribe. It, it's not going particularly well at the moment with coronavirus. There's something about the nose flute that doesn't really fit with, with present conditions, but I'm sure it will have a renaissance. And that's, uh, that's something we're looking forward to. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I, I, think, I think our time is our time is about up. So we'd love to answer any questions that you have about, um, about what we're up to. And it's been an absolute pleasure sharing things with you. Wow. Um, Simon, it's, uh, it's astonishing uh, what, what you're doing with these young people and your outreach to the world is, um, is exciting and incredibly special. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I think I better let um, someone else uh, start things off. Um, if, uh, if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask it. I, I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Simon, is your school a public school or a private school? Yeah, we're, we're a public school. So we're in uh, rural mm -hmm. Somerset. So we are the, the school you go to if you come from the villages around here. Uh, it's, yeah. it's so wonderful that you're able to, to, to have this kind of program going in a public school. One of the things I haven't had a chance to talk about is how we fund it. And so the main funding actually comes from plant sales. So uh, behind mm -hmm. the girls here, you've got our current shop. So um, we sell through shows, we sell online. And actually, um, I'm a massive fan that if you generate your own income through enterprise, then you can decide how you spend that. So the students that go on the trips, uh, it's not because they've got rich parents, they're the ones who've done the work. So they've, they've earned their way on. I was just gonna say that um... If you've ever been to um, any kind of uh, orchid event in, in Great Britain, um, there is usually a table of Ridlington School seedlings and, and uh, you know, a, a usually very rare and unusual and fantastic species um, selling at bargain prices. It's really remarkable, which I guess you can do when you're growing plants from seed, but um, I think you should charge more. Personally, maybe you could, maybe you could, uh, well, uh, I've got the advantage, advantage. Yeah. I've got the advantage a... of child labour. So, um, so if you look back <laughs> at the history of the UK, uh, the, the British Empire was, was largely built on child labour. So, uh, yeah, I, I recommend it. I have a great idea. Okay. Maybe then, maybe when COVID is over and we finally get to put on our orchid show again, 
maybe we could have you folks come and yeah. be a vendor. We'd, we'd absolutely love to, providing we can work with some local schools. So, I'm sorry. Uh, we'd, we'd be very happy to come as long as we can work with some schools. So one of the things we're very keen to do is to take mm -hmm. part in events. So this happened in South Africa when mm -hmm. we were invited after we'd won a gold medal at Chelsea. We were invited to go to the Cape Town Flower Show and uh, with some support and some fantastic accommodation up in the Yonkersuk Mountains. Um, we said, we're only coming if we can work with some schools. Uh, and as a result, we've worked with a school in Cape Town, which has got a fantastic project of its own, which is support, supported by the local council. So, so yeah, we're... we're um, does everyone say yes to going in? Yeah, yeah. I would mind that. Yeah, everyone, everyone says yes. Everybody says yes, they want to come to Hawaii. <laughs> I, I was going to suggest that we, you have some of the, certainly we can arrange for, um, for you to work with uh, some of the people at the, at the U8 and some of the, and Kamehameha School and some of the other high schools around here that might have horticulture programs. I was going to suggest that it would be a really wonderful experience for some of your students to intern at some of our fantastic orchid nurseries. Because we have on the Big Island in particular, but, but all of the Hawaiian Islands, some of the best growers in the world um, that I think could, not that you guys have any trouble growing orchids, you're fantastic at it, but I think it would be a great experience for any of your students that, that would like to go into um, the orchid business or orchidology in general um, as a scientist or uh, to have the experience of, um, of interning for a week at a really, really, uh, um, uh, you know, first class nursery. And we've got, we've got tons of them. So we can probably put together a very nice program for a couple of students. I'm sure that I know personally, um, we have the ability to, to um, maybe uh, house a student or two here at, uh, here at Charles Mance's house, um, but, but I'm sure other members would love to have uh, a couple of your students uh, with us as well. So uh, I think we can really make something quite wonderful for you. We've, we've been thinking about that. If, if we can pull that off this summer, then that would be Alice here and, uh, and Jess who's uh, currently at uh, Oxford University, who, um, who's just spent one the year there, who would be uh, fantastic pioneers, I think, for coming across and, and getting involved. And maybe the year after, I, I think it would be uh, Izzy and Laura would be the yeah. two obvious candidates, which is, yeah. so that, that's why those, those are the people I've, I've called in especially today. So it would be lovely if we can make something happen. Well, we got yeah. it down first, but uh, I, I, think, I think we're on our way, finally. <laughs> So if we are able to put a show on this year, the dates of our show through the second weekend in June. Is that right, Tom? Uh, that, that would be way too early, I think, with the way COVID is looking at the moment. So um Yeah, yeah, we, we're we're pretty much expecting that we won't be able to put on a show, but we do have the place booked just in case. But yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I was just going to say that um, I'm, it's, I can't really see everyone, so if you have a question, put it in the chat, please. And uh, the chat is down at the bottom of the screen, the little uh, window, the you know, little cartoon window. Um, just uh, send a message to, to all of us, and we can, then, um, we can then ask your question for you. I'm not seeing a whole lot, but ah, uh, you know, it's the last weekend in June. But but even so, it's, uh, mm -mm. it's no, not this year. It's no, Father's so. Father's Day weekend. Right, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have a question from Dennis Benson, uh, and the question is generally, what is the age of most of the students that are in your orchid program? So, um, uh, just have a quick thing. So, when, when did you start on the project, Alice? Do you want to jump in a bit quicker? Bit, bit quicker? Uh, I started when I was 11. I've done it all the way through when I'm 18. Because I think that's too young to have done it. Um, but I think 
So, so one of the great things, if you start at 11, uh, the rate you learn things when you're 11, it means that by the time you're uh, 15, you, you know a lot about a lot of stuff, which works really well. Um, we don't just talk to that. It's actually, Ed, do you want to give a quick demonstration of unicycling? So uh, we also have a, something of history in circus. So um, uh, I, I was a circus performer at one stage in my life. And uh, so we do have... For a bit of entertainment, there we are, Ed on a unicycle. Round of applause for Ed. There we are. Where is it? Where is Ed? There we are. No, it's just it? Oh yeah. There, there, he he is. Is. there he is. There we are. But that was him falling off without breaking anything, which is also great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ed. So, um, Simon, how do you select students to be in this program? Okay, so I don't select students, they select themselves. Uh, it's very much open to everyone and it's come along. You, you don't have to commit to ruining your life by spending every moment here and losing all your friends, but that, that is allowed. Um, but, um, but equally, there are things that we go out of our way to target. So I may well get a teacher who will send a thing to me and says, um, I've got a student in my tutor group. Um, uh, they may be struggling in school. I think they may benefit by coming to the greenhouse and meeting the rest of the team. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it kind of just builds over time. So it, it's one of those things that we are, our doors are always open and we're, we're glad to welcome people in. Simon, have you found that some of your graduates have um, gotten a little more serious about ORCIDs? I, I know that some of your students have presented at international conferences and scientific events. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm rather relieved they don't all end up in horticulture because it, it's, not, it's not renowned as being the most well-paid or uh, uh, necessarily the easiest of careers. And, and actually, of course, with a real project, you get all those experiences. So whether it's the business side, whether it's the marketing side, whether it's running the IT systems that we do, um, the one thing that students get is used to talking to people. And it doesn't matter what you're going into, the, the ability to share what you care about and what you love is something that will always work. So we have several, I suppose we've got several at the moment that have headed into uh, wildlife conservation uh, or the ecology side of things is, is quite a common one. We have students in horticulture and uh, yeah, we have others in other places who, who keep plants as, as part of what they care about, uh, though they may be uh, designing cars as a, as a thing that gives them their money. Uh, I, I know that, that having a... Um... Uh, a manager of a laboratory is a very marketable skill. Uh, it certainly is. Yes. So I, I don't know if any of your uh, any of your lab managers have gone in that direction. Uh, yes, yes, they, they definitely have. Uh, and um, uh, uh, how, oh yeah, I'm looking at some of the other. Talis has got the questions coming through. Um, yeah, so. One of the things that's very useful being a lab manager is you can go to an interview at a university with some seedlings in your pocket. And there is nothing quite like uh, pulling out a jar of little tiny living things and telling their story part, part way through what you're doing to show <laughs> you really know what you're doing. Um, we've seen lots of pictures there. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave you because uh, we've got the school day starting uh, and I have to run COVID tests on all the students as they, uh, as they come through the doors. So I'm, I'm going to have to head that way. But it, it's been an absolute pleasure joining you this morning. And, uh, much, much more so for us. Um, thank you. Uh, it, it was very generous of you to volunteer to do this for us. Um, and I would just urge everyone that, that's uh, here tonight to think about the Red Lincoln School. Uh, think about um, what they're doing for the future of orchid conservation and education about orchids. Um, this is something we can all be proud of. So, um, Kilo Orchid Society has, uh, has given a small donation. The American Orchid Society has recognized them and given a, a, a nice donation to them as well, specifically for the Sarawak program. Um, I would just encourage all of you to keep track of, of Ridlington School and to be as helpful as you can. And hopefully, we can have programs like that here in Hawaii as well. Mm -hmm. We, we would love to meet you all one day, meet you in person. Uh, you'll definitely be seeing some of us. Mo most likely <laughs> to come over in small groups, I, I would think. The, the yeah. other thing that occurred to me is I can see there's lots of questions. So 
I don't know if you want to collate those and send those through in an email, but we're happy to to give longer answers to all, all those bits and pieces. And uh, we'll do that. And and we'll and we'll stay in touch. It's been lovely to meet you. Indeed. Thank you so much. Great day at school. Thanks for getting up early. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. So oh, that was wonderful. That's, wasn't that really, I don't know. I, I've been, we've had so much negativity here in the U.S. for the last few days. How wonderful to see, what a wonderful, hopeful thing. It is to be um, to, to see a program like this and to see the enthusiasm of uh, these young people and learning and, and doing something good in the world. Uh, so uh, I'm thrilled. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. It was one absolutely, I think this is one of our best um, meetings. And thank you, Lillian, for, um, for reminding me to start the recording. <laughs> Indeed. So, it's, so always, the whole thing is, the whole thing has been recorded. Yeah, I always forget. So, so, so that's great as well. Um, are we, uh, that reminds me then, are we going to have an archive so that people can access if we want to tell people about this presentation? Where would we uh, direct them to go? So not... this, is, this is Larry. So um, let, let me uh, try to take care of that. If I can uh, download the, um, the recording, then we may be able to put it on our website uh, or there, there's a couple other places. Okay, okay so, that, so that's to be determined, but it can be done. All right, uh, when, when you should get a copy of the recording as I will. Um, yeah, it'll show up in the email. So we'll just make sure that that gets out for anyone that wants to revisit this. And I certainly do. I, I definitely want to see that again. How amazing to see Paphiopetalum sandrianum in bloom in the wild. In the wild. Now you can, wow. You can sort of understand those petals uh, growing up <laughs> just like that. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense why it would have those. So, just just extraordinary. Um, does anyone else have? Uh, I, I I think it's probably too late for us to do a show and tell, but um, <laughs> we'll absolutely do it next uh, next month, and uh, maybe we'll make a special time for that, uh, and uh, and we figure out exactly what's happening for next month. Um, I also just want to thank everyone for um, staying up past the <laughs> uh, and and uh, and you know supporting uh, supporting not just the Gila Orchid Society but this incredible program in England that we need to we need to get a Ridlington school everywhere uh, and, and certainly here in Hawaii. So, all right, folks. Um, unless there's other comments, um, I'll, I will uh, let us adjourn and uh, we can get our beauty rest for tomorrow. <laughs> All right, I certainly need it. Good night, everyone. Shaka, aloha. 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 Thank you.